at uh, Grey Ghost Vineyards. We can't begin to tell you how much we appreciate all you've done in support of us. Hey, time out. Okay, let's try this one more time. We got, and that was um, the producer's fault who didn't turn on the microphone. Lori's clapping, Pete and Peg are here. Jimmy says we're muted. Checking in, when you can hear us, tell us you can hear us. Lisa Carey can hear us, and Virginia Weintime can hear us, so I say we just go for it, because we have 17,000 people checked in. So. <laughs> So, Amy, are we on now? Yes, okay. now we're on. Jimmy says we are on now. Now we're starting afresh. Thanks again for joining us. We're looking forward to this program. As you can notice, we're sitting on the crush pad, and we'll be talking a little bit about exactly what's happening. I don't know how many of you have been watching all of the programs. I know right after each one is over, Cheryl, Amy, and I will sit down and watch it from beginning to end. And I am shocked at how much I've learned during the course of these programs. It's just amazing the information that's been given, and I hope you all have enjoyed them as well. Uh, it's really made winemaking a lot easier for me. As I said, we're on location. We're holding off the humor today until the very end. We've got so much material to cover. And before we get started, I do want to talk about one question that came up from last week, and it was a really good one concerning the Chardonnay and a movie called Bottle Shock. PJ, you were asking about uh, the color change in the movie going from brown to the standard color of Chardonnay. This has not happened to us, but it is a possible uh, result of a winemaking, actually over winemaking. If you're working with your raw juice and you keep it totally away from air, there's no possibility for the uh, phenomenon of oxidation and therefore it will happen in the bottle. However, it will ultimately fall out. What basically happened in the movie is the gentleman in the movie was so intent on making a great wine that he actually made too great of a wine. What we try to do at Grey Ghost is allow the raw juice to be oxidized, which will turn the juice a little bit on the brown side. Then, during the course of fermentation, those browning particles, those oxidized particles, will fall out, and the result is a crystal clear, a beautiful wine, a straw in color if it's done in stainless steel, and picking up a slight yellow pigment if it's done in oak. The pigment, of course, comes from the barrel. So that's basically what's happening. It is possible, but very unlikely, if you've allowed the juice to oxidize up front. So I hope that kind of explained it. Now, what we're going to be doing is enjoying one of the finest uh, meal-ending wines that we produce, and that's our adieu. So what I'm going to do is pour Cheryl and me our sample of a dessert wine, the 2019 Adieu. And one of the things that makes this so exciting is this particular wine has become one of the most award-winning wines we possibly have ever made. And there's glass number five. If I can find the glass, perfect. You'll note that we're keeping this wine chilled on ice. We personally like the Adu very, very cold. So with that, cheers to the Adu. We'll pick up that in a minute. Wow, that's a great mm -hmm. wine. Now, a little bit about this wine. The Adu is a late harvest Vidal made by allowing the grapes to hang about six, sometimes as much as eight weeks after the primary harvest. We're a little too far south to make an ice wine, so we have to rely on Botrytis or the noble rot in order to attack these grapes, basically raising them, concentrating the flavors in the fruit and also the sugar. Once the uh, grapes have been raisined, a special yeast has to be used 
in order to ferment this, this fruit since the sugar levels are so terribly high. The idea here is to make a wine very similar to a sauterne. We pick up a lot of the apricot, peach, hints of honey, and it's not going to be cloyingly sweet for those of you that are enjoying it tonight. We were really, really busy today, so we did not have an opportunity to put together a little fruit and cheese plate for ourselves. So we're just going to concentrate on the wine, which we probably would have done anyway. Now probably the most important segment of this whole program is the update that we get from Cheryl. So what I'm going to ask Cheryl to do is to go into depth once again on her week and what great things have happened and then what other things may have happened but didn't. Cheryl, do you want to go into your detail? Well, now that's worth repeating. I cannot thank you enough, Cheryl, for this tremendous update on your life at the vineyard. God bless you, my dear. <laughs> okay. Now, a little update about the vineyard. The Riesling has been picked and it's currently in the fermenter. Uh, if you remember from last week, the Save All has also been brought in. We did get the pick of the uh, Mel back and that's going to be processed a little bit later. We've had a lot of rain uh, this particular uh, uh, during the growing season at the tail end, a little bit more than we would have liked to have had, but things seem to be drying out pretty nicely. As you can see, we've got a, just a spectacular day so I'm really hoping it works out. Now, we are on the crush pad, and we're going to be going through a lot of the equipment today and take you step by step of what actually transpires during harvest. But before we do, we are going to put together, a, we have a little quiz put together for you, and each question relates back to one of the previous Zip Trip programs. Now, the interesting part is there's going to be six questions. There are six programs. We're on the sixth. So you have to listen very carefully for this program to get the answer to the last of the questions. Now, with that, what I'm going to have Amy do is hold up the question while I read it, and I'll give you the zip trip that it comes from so you'll be able to reference back since you are going to have a full week to respond, and this is going to kind of be like an open book test, so be, be prepared. The question number one from the zip trip was about the vineyard. Which of these pests are not, I repeat, are not a problem in the vineyard? A, deer, B, birds, C, raccoons, D, turtles, or E, bear? By the way, all of these questions will be repeated at the tail end of this program to make sure everybody has an opportunity. The zip trip number two featured the bottling of Grey Ghost wines. So the question is, which of the following is not used at Grey Ghost during bottling? Emphasis on not. Is it the semi-automatic bottle filler? Is it the vacuum corker? How about the screw-on bottle caps? Or color-coded capsules? Or E, the automatic labeling machine? Again, this question will be repeated at the end of the program. Zip trip number three. Cheryl and I took you out to the vineyard, or uh, took you on a tasting and a training program on how to taste. And there were a series of steps that we went through to enjoy the wine, which uh, was not a part of your training to taste wine during wine appreciation ses session zip trip number three. Was it zip trip? Was it the use of stemmed glassware? Sight and smell? C, sip, slurp and splash? Was it D, sip or swallow? Or E, I learned that all are used to appreciate my great Grey Ghost wine. 
Now we've gotten through half of the programs. Now what we're going to do is look at SIP trip number four, which dealt with our tanks and how tanks are used. Some of the parts of a tank at the Grey Ghost include everything listed except, emphasis on except, manways, was it sight lines, wooden valves, German stainless steel airlocks, or cooling jackets. The fifth SIP trip dealt with barrels in our barrel room, in which Cheryl and I took you downstairs and gave you a little education on barrels. There are two types of barrels used at Grey Ghost to ferment and or age wine. One of these is polyurethane barrels, copper barrels, French oak barrels, concrete barrels, or fiberglass barrels. Again, this will be repeated later. The final sip trip is what we're going to be doing today. And we're right here on the crush pad. So the question will be, which of the following does not happen at Grey Ghost during harvest. Most grapes are picked, hand-picked by volunteers, that's A. B, both red and white grapes are crushed during processing. C, whites can be fermented in stainless steel or in oak barrels. D, reds are fermented on the skins to extract color. Or E, all of the above happen at Grey Ghost during harvest. Now, the winner will be a drawing and will be announced later on based on anyone who gets a perfect score. And you will be, the winner will receive a bottle of today's featured wines. Please, please submit your answers to the website replies at greyghostvineyards.com. And your deadline for your correct responses, Al? It's going to be Saturday, September 12th at noon. So you have one week, and it's an open book test. Now let's start with harvests. You'll probably note that Cheryl and I are sitting in front of a large stack of funny-looking yellow things. These are called lugs. When we're harvesting, all grapes are hand-picked and put into these lugs, each holding approximately 25 pounds. They will be brought up to the winery, out of the vineyard. They will be weighed, and then they're stored in the building directly behind me in a warehouse room, which is hold at 56 degrees. This allows the fruit to both dry out if it's been a, a dewy morning and also allows it to be processed when it's cold. Once we get ready to start, all equipment is run on what's called three-phase. We generate all our own three-phase power right here at the Grey Ghost facility. One of the things we cannot afford to do is have equipment fail. So all three-phase units are in duplicate. So if for any reason one doesn't turn on, we immediately have the ability to switch to the second. We also run our own power system. So if for any reason power goes out, the entire facility can be operated on a very large generator that's located here at the winery and a backup generator that's located at our house that handles all of our water supply. Grapes are gonna be placed in an elevator. And at this point in time, I'm going to stand up and have Amy follow me around. An elevator is nothing more than a conveyor where the grapes are dropped in and then run up on the elevator. During this period of time, one or two people, oftentimes it will be Amy, stands on either side, culling the fruit, actually going through it, picking out any leaves, under or overripe fruit, anything that could be detrimental to the wine. When the grapes hit the top of the elevator, they then move into our destemmer. The destemmer 
is designed to remove the grapes from the stems, sending the grapes into an auger that's built into the destemmer and the stems coming out back. No one has ever seen the inside of the destemmer other than those people who work on the crush path. Tonight, I'm going to open it up and actually let you see the operation on the inside. As you'll notice, there's a stainless steel drum perforated with holes about the size of a, qu a quarter. On the inside of the drum are paddles. The paddles are designed to move the clusters to the rear. As they do, the grapes are getting hung up in the holes and they fall down into the base where the auger is going to move them into the pump. Now I'm going to turn this by hand so you'll see that the, the, uh, pal the uh, inside is moving in the opposite direction of the drum. This allows maximum extraction of the grapes. We're now going to close it up. As the grapes move through, they have not been crushed. They have strictly been destemmed. They then go down into an auger pump, which you can see at the base. We kind of overkilled on the pump. The destemmer operates at about three tons an hour. The pump operates at 12 tons an hour. So we slightly overkilled. The, the destemmer is Italian equipment. The pump is German. If we're producing a white, it's going to move into presses. If we're producing a red, it's going to go into bins. Now before I continue on the individual red and white and what goes on, do I have any general questions associated with what's happened up to now? The only question that you had came from Lisa and it had to do, I'm guessing on the last question you asked in the quiz, question, does B mean separately or together? Means separately, but that's a good question. Now keep in mind, when the fruit goes into the destemmer, we do not have a crusher in the destemmer. We do not have a crusher for a reason. We do not want to break the seeds. If you've ever taken a table grape and bitten into a seed, you'll notice how bitter that is. And this is one bitterness that we do not want to get into our wine. So when Cheryl and I purchased this, and this is called the Manta Destemmer, we had them remove the crushers so that the grapes go directly into the destemmer. And since the fruit is already very ripe, the skins are going to be broken on their own. Now let's talk specifically about the white wine. As I mentioned, the grapes are going to be moving through the pump and head into our press. All of our presses are German, and again, as you'll notice, we have duplicate units, so that if for any reason one press goes down, we can immediately revert to the second. We have one press open, so you'll actually be able to see the inside. Inside the press is a bladder. The bladder is designed to be inflated with compressed air once the press is filled. An individual press holds about two tons of grapes or about 4,000 pounds. Once filled, doors are placed on this opening, locked into place, and then compressed air is pumped into the pump, extracting the juice. The juice goes through the slits of the wall of the press and then drops down into a tray. And you'll notice the tray is designed to hold the juice and allow us to move it directly into tanks. Once it's in the tray, a special pump is attached to the unit, pulling the juice out of the tray and moving it into stainless steel. It is going to be held in stainless steel for about 48 hours. This allows any sediment to fall out, and now we have clear juice to work with. From there, it goes in one of two directions. It's going to stay in the barrels, which we were in, or stay in the tanks, which we were in in an earlier session, and be cold fermented, or it's going to go down into a barrel, 
which we also discussed earlier, where we ferment in oak and allow those white wines to age. That's what's happening to a, a white. Are there any questions about the processing of whites? Yes, Matthew Perry asks, what do you do with the stems after they've been going through this device? All stems and skins which have been pressed out go into compost and ultimately go back out to the vineyard. Skins and stems are very high in nutrients, high in nitrogen, high in potassium. So if we can get that cycled back into the vineyard, it actually adds fertilization or nutrients to the soil in the vineyard. Now what we're going to do is talk a little bit about reds. The reds have gone through the same process that we did a moment ago where we took them, ran them through the destemmer without crushing and then come out in the auger. The reds then move into one of two locations. We have a special tank in the tank room for fermentation of reds, but most of our reds are small lot fermented. And what we have over here are two of the bins that are stacked right now. These are fiberglass bins, and each bin holds approximately a ton to a ton and a half of grapes. Once filled, the lids that are being stored inside are placed on top. We leave these uh, grapes, this raw juice and grapes, to macerate for about three hours before yeast is added. This allows a little more extraction of color prior to the be fermentation beginning. Once the yeast is added, these bear, uh, bins have to be wa watched very closely because carbon dioxide gets trapped in the skins, causing them to float to the top. And of course, that's where the color is. So if we don't press that or push it back down into the juice, we don't extract all the colors from the skins that we really want. A bin fermentation normally takes about 12 to 14 days. Once it's completed, these caps that have been floating now collapse into the finished wine. And from there, if you can imagine it, this one and a half tons of now finished wine and skins are hand bucketed back into the press where the juice or the finished wine is now pressed out of the exhausted skins and then is going to move into stainless steel. We move it to stainless steel because we want that wine to be as clear as possible before it comes down into the barrels. So we actually leave it on steel for about 72 hours. This allows the raw sediment to collapse to the bottom and then the finished wine is gravity fed down into oak where the aging process begins. Any sediment that was left in the tank is now put into carboys. This allows the sediment to concentrate even more. The clear wine are then racked off and now we use that for topping off wine. The aging process on a red is in from eight months for a Cabernet Franc to three years for a reserved Cabernet. On the whites, it's anywhere from five months for the uh, Saval to as long as a year and 15, uh, about 15 months for our reserved Chardonnay. I'm going to head back to now, if there's any questions, be sure you get ready to answer. Ask them. What Amy is doing right now is she's running you a quick view of the vineyard so you can see the condition of the vine and what's getting ready to be picked. Amy, are there any questions that we need to respond to? Um, Matthew, well, Stacy Tiley and Matthew Perry both have the question mark hand bucketed. That's exactly what it is. Okay. <laughs> I guess they're wondering maybe why. It's bucketed because I don't have the type of a pump that would allow me to pull it out of the 
the bin and put it directly into the press. That's not the case with the tank. If I actually use the tank because I do have the ability